Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kamila Sodomska. Uh, I have the pleasure to moderate today's panel on the new challenges for the economy. And I have the pleasure to welcome our distinguished, distinguished guests. So, Jaron Brook, Iron Brand Institute. Hello. Hi. Matt Kiebe, Free the People. Hi. Hello. Martin Nowacki, ZPP. Rasen Stanchev, Sofia University. And Marek Tatawa from uh, Economic Freedom Foundation. Hello. So, new challenges for the economy. I think we can all name a few. Uh, starting with the pandemic, the lingering effects of the lockdown policies, the good and the bad. And now when we were already thinking that we can move towards the recovery, spend our amazing helicopter money, and start thinking about the bright green future, here it comes the war in Ukraine. And the energy crisis and the food crisis that is only to come, and hopefully will not, but we will discuss today how to avert those many crises that are going to face us in the future. So, but what all of these events actually have in common is that they have created the perfect conditions for the rise of the big government. So, I would actually like to ask uh, our first panelist, Yaren Brook, where the increased government control over the economy is the most visible, what challenges related to that are laying ahead, and what can we do to mitigate them? That's a big, big question. Um, Sorry. No, that's fine. I, I think the biggest, um, the biggest challenge is everything that has to do with COVID. Um, the response to COVID uh, has been, I think, horrific in a sense of it has grown the state dramatically. It has given the state powers that I think particularly in the United States and in Western Europe, uh, nobody imagined the state even had. This idea that you could lock people down uh, was unimaginable. I, I could have never imagined that that would ever happen in the United States. If you told me that would happen in 2020 in the US, I would have said, now, that, you know, that's science fiction. Maybe China, okay, China maybe, but United States, never. And yet, it did happen. Uh, the fact that the response uh, to the pandemic was overwhelmingly statist, overwhelmingly uh, resulted in dramatic growth in government, in government spending, in government regulations, and in the government's knowledge of, of how much they can control all of us and what and, and, and the extent to which they uh, they can control us. So we're seeing the consequence of that. We're seeing uh, supply chains uh, struggling. Surprise, surprise, when you limit production, when you don't allow people to go to work, when you don't allow them to actually go and produce, less gets produced. And uh, supply chains and allocation of capital gets distorted. When uh, you, the Federal Reserve and the central banks bail out everybody, and if we just look at businesses, they bail out every struggling business. Their debt was bought out by the Federal Reserve, so we have a lot of zombie companies. You know what zombies are? The living dead, right? So you're alive, but you're really dead, uh, and the only reason you're alive is because the central bank is keeping you alive. And, then, and you're eating everybody else, too. And you're eating everybody else because by being alive, you have to eat. And therefore, you're taking from your healthier competitors, you're taking away by the very fact that you're consuming. And then finally, by the fact that government has spread money around and increased demands. So you've got increased demand, shrinking supply because of government actions, and a bunch of zombie companies uh, wandering around the, the economic landscape. And, and that combination is resulting in inflation. But also, I don't know if you saw this morning, um, the United States uh, we came out with uh, GDP numbers for the first quarter of this year, and they were negative. So the U.S. economy shrunk by 1.4% on an annualized basis in the first quarter of this year. Again, not surprising when you think of all the stuff that's been happening over two plus years 
that has been statist, <laughs> central planned, uh, and, and uh, you know, anti-freedom, anti-liberty, anti-free markets. So but these maybe, are the consequences. Just maybe this paradigm of growth and the absolute need to increase the economy year by year is just obsolete. Maybe we don't need it anymore. Well, human life maybe is obsolete. Right? Let's stop pursuing happiness. Let's stop pursuing well-being, human well-being, and, and let's just call it quits and lay down and, 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 and no, hu economic growth is, uh, is the, 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 you know, it's a manifestation of individual production. It's a manifestation of individuals living. Uh, there is no such thing as stagnation. You either move forward or you move backwards. Moving backwards is moving towards death, destruction, annihilation. Moving forward is production, creation, trade, value for value, win-win relationship. And if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. So no, there is no other paradigm in economics other than growth. And the only question is how do you establish growth and how do you make growth um, you know, fair in the sense that you don't want artificial economic growth like China, where you just pump money into the system and build apartments that nobody will live in. You want growth that is a consequence of real production. You want growth that is a, a result of actual increased human well-being. We will get to the question of sustainability and how sustainable the idea of sustainability is itself. But now I would like to dwell a little bit more into the question of the control that was beautifully pointed out. Uh, so I think a, a point that was made very clear, but uh, is that the the pandemic has increased the government's awareness of how much can they control. But now we are living in the age of perma crisis, so we're smoothly moving from one crisis to another. And actually, I wonder if the governments, if authorities, they have an interest in actually saying stop, just saying that okay, you know, guys, we're actually fine. And I have doubts. But nevertheless, the question is: so how do we navigate in this new environment? How do we preserve the space for the free market in a world that seems to be a one big danger that we need to be rescued from? So here, I would like to ask Matt Kiebe. So it, it's incredibly frustrating, and, and Joran and I and our colleagues have been traveling around Europe the last three or four days talking about the solution to all of these problems. and. In one sense, it's like incredibly simple. We need governments to show a little bit of humility and get out of the way. Um, COVID, very complex problem, radical uncertainty about the future, and the arrogance of bureaucrats, either in our case in Washington, D.C., but anywhere around the world, the arrogance that, that central planners <coughs> thought that they could come up with a one-size-fits-all plan, impose it with incredible amounts of violence from the top down, and in the process making everything, everything worse, this is what they do. And we had a war on COVID that utterly failed to win. Um, now we have a war in Ukraine, but uh, government's always at war. And they're at war with people being free to figure stuff out. And, and the challenge for us is not only to demand the freedom to figure stuff out for ourselves, but, but to figure out a compelling way to tell that story so that people who are frustrated, people who are feeling the pain of, of new inflation, feeling the pain of two years of lockdowns, maybe they weren't allowed to work, maybe their jobs don't exist anymore. All of these things are, are real pain and people are frustrated. Is that an opportunity? Or is that something that, that we just have to live with? I will tell you that um, these, these bureaucrats who won't get out of the way, and I'm going to pick on the European Commission for a second. Hopefully that's appropriate. But, but a top-level bureaucrat from the European Commission was quoted this week um, saying, quote, we have profited from fossil fuels, and it created enormous wealth at the expense of planet Earth. 
And as we realize right now, at the expense of geopolitical imbalances with our dependency on Russia, we both need to be repaired. In order to repair them, we need to pay more for energy and also for food. The two basic needs of life, food and energy, we have paid way too little for in the past 40 years. So the, the answer from bureaucrats who have helped create this situation is you need to suffer. And the fact that you haven't suffered enough is a sin against Mother Earth, I guess, but maybe a sin against the, the high priests at the European Union. Um, we're fighting against people who have no respect for human life and human dignity and the freedom to figure stuff out and all the things we're going to talk about today. Thank you. The point about suffering it makes me feel well, very, very well put. And I would never think that this kind of um, ideal of suffering, the so present with the Catholic Church, is going to come from the European Commission. Well, oh, the, no. The, the new ca- church. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, all, all the European Commission has done, all secular Western Europe or secular Europe has done, is secularized. Catholicism, certainly the aspect of guilt and, and, uh, and sacrifice, they have, they have secularized effectively and are using that. So people might not think of themselves as Christian, but they are. So we will come back to the question of uh, frustration and how to deal with it and uh, how to actually empower people again. But I would like to ask just maybe a slightly different perspective. So I agree with you all, but I wonder how it is that it's not the free market politicians or free market economists that currently have the ear of the regulators. So in principle, why are you in opposition if you're right and not them? And now maybe the point that will make it a little bit more visible is the kind situation with war. So I think everyone here will agree, despite our love and appreciation for free market and uh, liberalism, that uh, since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, some bold government movements were needed and welcomed. So where do we draw the line? Where do we want it? Where do we not want it? And how do we decide where a government action is needed? Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, wars are issues of government. So the the, the role of government, the, the, I think the only role of government, but certainly the primary role of government, is to defend their citizens, to defend their citizens for people who violate their rights, who would kill, murder, rape, pillage their villages. So the role of governments in a war is to, to, to defend their citizenship. But other than that, nothing changes in a war. So it is not true that suddenly when you have a war, you have to centrally plan your economy. Central planning doesn't work in peace, and it doesn't work in war. Okay, but maybe now I would like to ask Martin for his experience with the gas storage. Thank you. Uh, the problem with the energy sector is that uh, it's not a private sector. It's uh, at least in Europe, it's not just uh, regulated by by the government, which is correct and right. It should be regula- regulated by the government, governments. Uh, uh, but historically, most of uh, major European players are state-owned companies, and some of them, I believe. Can have can base their decisions and 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 plans on on uh, economic measures, but uh, at least last 20 years, as we observe, uh, uh, what what is happening, what what has been the case for the sector, uh, was uh, based on politics and and uh, political measures. Uh, so today, as we observe the trap we are. Uh, in terms of, of supplies from Russia at the, at the EU level, uh, is basically the result 
uh, of uh, of political decisions go. So there are member states in Europe that decided to be very close to, uh, to, to Russia in terms of the political presence, political pressure, political power uh, across across uh, Europe. Of course, it is partly related to economic goals as well. So, uh, I mean, in the long perspective, definitely the, the aim for Germany was to, to be a major key and the only one uh, trader of the Russian gas uh, uh, in Europe. And I just, like, from the sub kind of subjective point of view, I understand that, that willingness to, to be that or, uh, offensive and, and uh, to, to, to kind of proceed with that plan. Uh, uh, but short term, all the decisions, investments were definitely not the part of the business plan. Uh, it was basically in a way sponsored by, by, by two, uh, two, two countries to get uh, political influence. And we ended up with the, uh, with the situation. Uh, so first of all, we have large state-owned companies. And if we have one European energy market, it's, I'm glad that we didn't have uh, just private companies in Poland because this ta at that stage it would be, there would be uh, Russian companies or, or German Russian companies. Uh, so you know it's kind of tricky how to counterbalance the situation uh, in the longer perspective. Uh, and what should be the uh, what should be the role of the state? And you asked about the infrastructure. I mean, definitely. That might be the role of the of the state to keep or somehow uh, heavily regulate the, the access to to the infrastructure, and then allow different operators, different uh, market players to uh, uh, to work on that. And today we have some uh, infrastructure regarding the gas storage that is uh, uh, is not European. That's another actually problem uh, we have, but it's also not private. I mean, it is a you know, company owned by, by the Russian state-owned company. Uh, so it's definitely not the market-based uh, um, uh, uh, environment. So my position is that uh, in terms of the infrastructure, it relates to both the storage, uh, uh, interconnectors, uh, pipes, uh, whatever is needed to somehow manage and stabilize the system, uh, it, it might be the, the role of the state, but then trading, selling, or, or uh, supplying, uh, that should be uh, the the, uh, the area of, of 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 market players, of private players, uh, to to compete, to operate, to, uh, in a again in a uh, sector that is heavily regulated. It's, I mean, heavily. It is regulated and we, we, we must uh, accept that. Uh, but unfortunately, again, there are decisions that are made uh, mostly in Europe uh, on the basis of, of uh, pure politics. Uh, although there are some countries that make a different case that we are not, we are not going into sanctioning Russia, because economically it doesn't make sense for us. I mean, we have a cheap gas, we have you know, a direct pipe to, to, to our state, and we, uh, they argue with this you know, economic uh, perspective that it's simply better, cheaper for, for their economies, for, for their citizens to use that gas uh, in the right now in the, in the longer perspective. I mean, I think there's a really important point here. The energy mess that is Europe, and Europe is an energy mess right now, is a consequence of government policy. This is not a consequence of markets. This is not a consequence of markets failing or markets not working. There are no markets in energy. This is completely controlled by the government. Inde and indeed, I, we're going to disagree here because I believe that the solution is a complete deregulation of energy markets. Everything from supply to storage to, um, to production to every aspect of the oil industry, and you will get what you get when you always privatize. You would get increase in quality and a decrease in prices and a diversification in sources. I will if all player, players are private. Uh, in that all players are private. In that case, uh, Russia would own 
all the, of the infrastructure. Russia is not rich enough to own all the infrastructure in, in Poland. It, it just I mean, isn't. Okay, so maybe I would just add a side note for our audience who might not be uh, familiar with what has happened exactly with gas storages that were supposedly private. So we've had a situation for the the last two years in particular where gas storages in uh, Germany, Austria and the Netherlands, which together compose 75% of European gas storage capacity, were nearly, nearly empty effectively pumping up the price for gas in winter and contributing to the energy crisis. And of course, these were private gas storage facilities that were owned by a private gas company. But now, um, Ms. Kassen, right? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a similar point to Aaron's. So uh, a couple of years ago, I had to compare uh, the, the, the costs of uh, uh, energy infrastructure in Europe with the cost of energy infrastructure of the United States. And in Europe, it's 35% more expensive than in, in the United States. And uh, another thing which is very important for the recent years and is connected to the war in Ukraine is the so-called Green Deal. The Green Deal, and Frederick remembers, you know, last year we made this point, you know, at the Free Market Roadshow, the Green Deal was uh, an obvious sponsorship of gas import from Russia and state-owned companies from Russia. And if you look at the, uh, at, 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 at the, the export of energy resources from Russia from the beginning of the Green Deal, which is 2018, until the end of last year or the January last, uh, this year, the increase is 41% both in volumes and, of course, of price. So this gave the revenue, you know, to finance such, uh, such a stupid operation like, uh, like the war, war in Ukraine. It's obvious. It's so obvious. And what is the problem now, in my point of view, is that irrespectively the war, irrespectively the obvious connection between the financing of the war and the Green Deal and, of course, energy, Tendency, you know, the, the, the European Union is still contributing, you know, to the Green Deal. But Matt just read, it's, it's just crazy, you know. The war shows that there are more important things than the climate change. And it's so obvious. And respectively of all this, you know, they continue pressing this. It's stupid. It's plainly stupid. Sorry. Is it stupid or, or cynical? Because I, I don't think it's that number of member states, governments, uh, the experts don't know this. I think it's just a cynical game and they really, you know, are proceeding with, with, the, uh, with the kind of master plan and narrative. They simply want to... Uh, I'm now in Brussels, you, you can hear uh, strong voices and uh, influential uh, people that we must be even, you know, faster uh, with delivering the, the Fit for 55 or the whole Green Deal package, so we can be more independent uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, they don't add that we'll be more dependent on specific technologies and, China. and, uh, and including and China we'll and so on. And poorer, significantly I, poorer. I think they know what they say and they are simply not afraid, those countries are not afraid. Also historically they have the, the point uh, of Russia, they want to cooperate with Russia and now Russia simply, uh, I mean the, the, I think Germany, Austria, they are surprise of the situation of the position of Russia because the long-term business plan was kind of broken by um, by Putin's uh, emotions and and, uh, and his decisions too. but that was a planned cynical game yeah I mean I think it's there's two things That's going on and, and you can read this in the statement the EU has an ideological vision of an economy that doesn't ever depend on fossil fuels. And, and beyond that, that you would pay a lot more for food, you know, food's not a choice. Food is something that you need to live. 
So, so ultimately, it, it feels kind of uh, an anti-growth, anti-human sort of ideology. But, you know, practically speaking, we've been talking about this at other aspects of the roadshow, the number one cheerleader and scaremonger against fracking in Germany and other countries in Europe has been Vladimir Putin and Russian today. Um, spreading all, and Matt Ridley, the ration, author of The Rational Optimist, has documented this. Um, Putin has been out there telling you that you can't create alternatives to Russian gas. And that is certainly self-serving and cynical. Um, but it's also suicidal for the rest of Europe to, to sort of, like, this isn't just about energy. This is about power. And not just the kind of power that turns on the lights. Who is going to control your future? Who is going to decide if your country survives um, if you unilaterally disarm and say, you know what, we're not going to let entrepreneurs figure out better ways to create energy, maybe greener ways to create energy. Um, we're just going to step back and let really bad guys determine our future for us. It's a, it's a shockingly horrible position. It is a shockingly horrible position. However, uh, for some reason, currently, most of the general public believes it is the safe way. So the free market um, proponents are, are the, these are the bad guys. I'm sorry, guys, but you're the villains. Like, sit in here. Those are the bad guys. You're the bloodthirsty capitalists who have destroyed the world. So uh, I'm sorry if I'm doing a bad job as a moderator. Audience, please, you're most welcome to ask the questions. I'm looking uh, out for some Fridays for Futures activists here. And if not, then I'm going to do this job. So you, we have killed. And your generations have killed the planet Earth. And those are the young people that are going to suffer and die inevitably in a terrible, terrible way. So with all this and the loss of trust in liberalism, how do you do this? How do you now get from uh, this? And if I may, I would like to address this question to Marek, who still didn't get the chance, chance to speak yet. Uh, first of all, thank you for invitation. And just one comment about uh, uh, the war topic, uh, because when the war started, and it was the same with the pandemic, I heard many speeches from politicians saying, now there is a reason to increase taxation. Yeah. And then I was making little comments to their tweets, but you also have like 40% of GDP spent on other stuff than tanks, uh, aircrafts, and so on. Maybe you can just shift these expenditures to spend on security more and less on inefficient uh, welfare state. Uh, so there is money. It's, it's not true that there is no money for security. There is a lot of money for security, and security is, should be priority number one, and I think we, know, we see now for the government's safety of private property, of our lives, and uh, we should remind politicians that the money exists. The money of taxpayers exists in the budget, and they can shift uh, categories in the budget and not demand more taxes. And speaking about losing liberalism, I am not so sure. I, I mean, you, you see a lot of, you know, status areas, uh, ideas around. But uh, I think it's that we are losing the communication battle because there are many success stories of liberalism, both during the pandemics and also now during the uh, refugee crisis. I heard uh, Mikołaj Pisarski saying that, uh, speaking about refugees coming to Poland, and it was success of private initiative. It was not like centrally planned government program uh, that, you know, you cross border and then you are guided, oh, you go to Warsaw, you go to Krakow, you go to Gdańsk. It was spontaneous uh, uh, initiative of uh, thousands of Polish people. They were using their money, their cars. Then local governments became in, involved, but it was still decentralized system, and it worked well. You don't see thousands of refugees, you know, lying in the streets or big squares of Poland. They are somewhere in Polish people houses, uh, and it was the same with providing food, resources, a lot of spontaneous activities of people. So this should be presented as a success story of liberal ideas. Uh, the same with pandemic. You, we had many 
press conferences of politicians in front of you know big aircrafts, including the one that was destroyed in Ukraine, full of masks, and they were bravely saying, oh, we ordered 1,000 masks or uh, some other machines. But then, at the same time, you had uh, alcohol-producing companies switching their production lines into sanitizers and other stuff. You had thousands of people in Poland, for example, suing masks at home, not only like first idea was to help people, but the second idea, oh, you can sell a mask for 10 zlotych. There is also opportunity to earn some money here, and it's great. And I think the problem is that in the media, we are mostly uh, watching these, you know, press conferences of politicians, and we still don't have something like a website with, you know, 1,000 private, the best private initiatives of uh, to fight COVID uh, during the pandemic. And I think we should just do more in terms of communication. Free the People does a great job, but I think liberty movement should, in general, invest maybe a bit less, also shift our priorities, a bit less into ide policy ideas, because we already have shelves full of ideas, but more in communication. I mean, I think the important point here is Liberalism hasn't lost, free markets haven't lost. Every time they're attempted, every time they're allowed to function, they're a massive, unbelievable success. It's both the blindness of people to them, primarily the intellectuals and our professors and our economists and the people who teach and communicate, um, and it's our inability to communicate the ideas effectively. Uh, but the 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 reality is that our ideas win. Our ideas are the only ones that are successful. Capitalism, you said capitalism has destroyed the world. Capitalism is the only thing that's been successful in the world. It's the only thing that's brought people out of poverty. It's the only thing that has produced the kind of uh, society we live in. We just have not told the story well enough. And I do think, and, and you know, uh, I do think the challenge is much more difficult than most of us think it is because I do think it goes to a point made earlier about guilt, about sacrifice, about pain, and, and, and the noble ideal of sacrifice and pain and, and, and what Ayn Rand defined as altruism. It does go to the, to the idea of a morality of self-interest, and these are issues that many of us don't like talking about and uncomfortable talking about, uh, even though even Adam Smith talked about, right, the baker doesn't bake the bread for you. He bakes the bread because he's trying to make a living for himself. So until we're willing to defend capitalism consistently and passionately on the economic level, on the political level, on the philosophical level, on the moral level, we will lose. But we need all of it, and we need to do a lot more than we're doing today because the fact is everybody in the world is against us. We're outnumbered, particularly among intellectuals we're outnumbered. And this is why all these different projects that all these different groups are engaged in, we just need more of them. So liberal organizations need more central planning? Uh, we, need, we need the opposite. And, and I, I'm going to argue with uh, Yarn a little bit. I, I don't like the C word because the market process isn't really about capital accumulation. It just happens to be one of the things that happen when, when entrepreneurs create things that people want. Um, I do think we need to explain the difference between centralized control and the arrogance of planners and the collusion of insiders and, and the way that big businesses and big governments game the system so that people can't live, they can't buy energy, they can't buy food. And most importantly, when they're dealing with difficult times, the entire point of the market process is that it allows for decentralized people from different places with different knowledge and different needs and different wants to figure out how to fix the problem. And that, I think, is our point on how to solve the energy problem. I'm not up here telling um, folks in Poland that fracking is the answer, or nuclear, or buy your energy not from Russia, but buy it from somebody else. I'm telling you that, that you need a radical system of decentralization that gets the insiders out of the way so that smart people and normal people and people that need to put fuel in their cars um, can, can be free to figure that problem out. So uh, to me, it's, it's a process of, of, of convincing people that their overlords have failed them and that there's a little bit of responsibility when they look in the mirror to say, you know what, we need to get together and we need to figure this out, otherwise we're screwed, our families are screwed. 
I think maybe the, the main problem is that we're talking here about the ideas, about abstract things, and then people go on Twitter and then they see pandas and mating glaciers, and this talks to them on an emotional level, and they are never going to spend so much time if they see a sad panda on the internet as listening to you. Your ideas are amazing, but people need to want to listen to them. And it also brings a point, so uh, this week I've been attending a European Economic Congress and I have attended a panel about disinformation, which was exclusively dominated by uh, the topic of Russia. So the point that was brought by all those amazing experts from PISM, from East uh, Stratum, from EU versus disinformation is that Russian TV simply won, even in Ukrainian houses, and in Russia itself, that's of, of course, it doesn't have competition because it was more entertaining. It was more compelling. It was, it spoke to people. Questions? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Mark had a very good uh, point about uh, the, the battle of interpretations. And uh, that the, the, the public opinion I don't think, by the way, that uh, the so-called fake news and uh, disinformation is, uh, is, is, is an important phenomenon. This is an important phenomenon, but this is a consequence of something else. And uh, this something else is the competition or the battle of different ent interpretations. And here, on the front line, on the, the initiators, are the politicians. If you look at the... Uh, rhetoric of the European Union in the last uh, three years. So you look at the uh, uh, names of different commissioners. You have a commissioner for the people, of the economy for the people. You have, uh, uh, if you look at uh, the programs, you know, the Green Deal. You know, what, what is Green Deal? It's, it's nonsense, you know, white deal. If you look at the uh, uh, next generation, what is next generation? So I'm next generation until I'm alive, you know. So, uh, so the, the, the next generation, if you look at the statistics of the next generation, so uh, the, the government debt of the European Union, which is like 90% of the GDP, will be paid by the next generation. And the statistics is very simple. You take the government debt and divide it on the number of people between age of one and age of 17. And you will see that this generation is paying seven times more than the overall whatever population of the European Union. So, but all these things, they come as a, all, all the, the interpretations, they come as a, as a echo. So, the, somebody comes at the United Nations, uh, whatever, uh, because uh, Greta Thunberg was there, and says, you know, next year, Next year we will do, you know, everything possible to reduce the greenhouse emissions by 50% for the last, for the next five years, for example. That's uh, uh, oh, yeah. Boris Johnson, yeah? <laughs> so, that's Boris Johnson. So who has never been a green person, you know? But he's running, you know, for, for, for re-election. So he would like to be, you know, nice to the people. And here comes somebody. You know who is uh, between mad and, and 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 preoccupied with some idea. Lots of people are preoccupied with such ideas. So and here then come the politicians and they they discover something. You know they discover their uh, their horse in the competition for ideas and votes. And that's that's how it works. I was lecturing in 2019 for the European Liberals at the uh, Theodor Heuss uh, Academy in Gummersbach. And uh, uh, suddenly I realized that I have, uh, I have most of the European liberals in, their, in, in the room. And I asked them, you know, why you are not opposing the Green Deal? You know, you are sitting in the European Parliament. Uh, some of you uh, are in the local governments of Germany. Some of you are even members of the, of the Bundestag and uh, in, in other countries as well. In Holland, you know, they have always been a part of the governing coalition. They said, we would never do that. I said, why? Well, because we are losing elections. They were absolutely plain about this. And that's why they renamed their, the liberals, they renamed their whatever name, and now they're 
renew Europe. But they sound like renewables, and they, and they intentionally rename their political faction in the European Parliament in order to sound like renewables. That was intentional. Thank you. Just, just to follow up on the, on the storytelling, I think that uh, the, the kind of keyword was, uh, uh, was brought by Matt about uh, uh, decentralized systems uh, and decentralized sectors. Every time we have a sector, uh, business sector that is decentralized, we can easily uh, use it as a great example of, of, uh, uh, of uh, free economy. Uh, and uh, the other way around, if we have really highly concentrated sectors, it's most, in most cases quite easy to uh, uh, to name uh, to call that there is no, no market involved. There are you know monopolies, duopolies, uh, and other polis uh, involved. Uh, so let's just uh, like in Poland. Poland is a perfect example of how. Uh, decentralization of, of, of sectors uh, work. We just had a press conference with the transport sector about two days ago. Uh, never got uh, an, uh, an, uh, uh, kind of uh, support from the government. It wasn't subsidized anyway from, from Brussels. It wasn't uh, owned by the state-owned uh, companies. It's not until today. We have 38,000 SMEs operating in the transport sector and dominating the European market. Uh, and we had, uh, and they were able easily to, with this uh, volume of, of companies, uh, also uh, diversified uh, market presence in terms of uh, states in in Europe. They were easy uh, to come and, and say that they want they don't want to go to Belarus or, and to Russia. That they are able to stop the activities and stop the trade with Russia uh, due to the fact that most of the trade with Russia is done by Polish truckers. Uh, so it shows how uh, really you know, diversified, decentralized uh, sectors can be, can be efficient. And I think we have plenty of examples, not just here in Poland on the refugees, but Internally in Ukraine, the people of Ukraine are extremely decentralized right now, but it works. It's kind of really spontaneous order how people <coughs> supply themselves, how they uh, commute, uh, easily transport goods. Uh, every time we need a transport to Ukraine, it's suddenly, you know, over, uh, actually overnight we can get one uh, uh, coming to, towards our other location and, and get it. Uh, every time I go to Lviv, on the same day, the same hour, there is another bus coming. It's not state-owned, it's not a large corporation, uh, that there is no large uh, entity involved. And within an hour, it goes further to the, uh, to the central Ukraine or to, to the east. Uh, so really we have a number of perfect examples of how uh, so-called the, the decentralized systems uh, can work and are f really full of, of free enterprise. Can I have a comment to what you said about capitalism and, uh, and, and the language? Just one, uh, Jaron, and then you, okay? Okay. Yeah, okay, I will be. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, I agree that it's also not a good word to use, and when uh, Leszek Balcerowicz uh, uh, the founder of my previous think tank, Civil Development Forum, and Minister of uh, Finance during transition, uh, was speaking about uh, changes in Poland from socialism to free market economy. He was uh, saying he was not using the word capitalism because it was demonized during socialism. So he was just using the word Western time economic model because many people in Poland then had. I, I, I know that in the 80s, I think the model was much better than today. But many people had good image. Like West was something great for them, and they wanted to have life like in the Western economy. But the problem was that the world was just demonized by, by socialists. And I think it's the same with many other ideas. And I, I basically, I also don't agree that we speak here about ideas because we speak about the people and individuals. And uh, what we propose already lifted thousands and hundreds of people out of poverty. The, the other ideas like socialism killed Two thousands 
thousands of people all around the world. So, so this is and about the people. And that would make an amazing also, Twitter thread. Yes, and, and, and also about demonization. Like every time I speak about, well, very often I speak about the free market model, what we should achieve in Poland, what examples people give in opposition that, oh, your perfect model exists. They, said, they say Somalia. Uh, as an example of perfect free market state, uh, or they say about uh, uh, Congo colony of King Leopold. Uh, and this is like the only examples they can give. Uh, this is really, really, re really stupid, but this is like what we have to fight with, like this kind of demonization of free market ideas because they create some alternative vision of free market and then they say, oh, it's, it's your, this is your like perfect model, fight with this. And, and unfortunately, this is like, a lot of effort that we have to, to do is just to fight with the strawman uh, ideas of, uh, of the other side. So, so I'm going to disagree with you guys. Um, I love the word capitalism. I think it's a fabulous world um, because it's not about capital uh, and capital formation. It's about a particular system of government. It's about a particular social economic system that came into being in the late 18th century and early 19th century, and it works phenomenally well, has worked phenomenally well, and the idea that we should back away from it because the socialists who murder people, who destroy economies, who destroy industries, demonized it, is defeatist. And we shouldn't. We should fight for these words because they're important. And the fact is that nobody opposes capitalism because of the word capitalism. What they oppose is free markets. What they oppose is freedom. What they oppose is individual rights. It's, it, what they oppose is the ability of individuals to be free and, and pursue their own lives. Look, I, I, I think that um, uh, everything, everything we've said, we don't need more examples. I'm sorry, we don't need more examples. There are millions of examples out there. We need to better communicate those examples. We need to tell better stories. We need to elaborate on those examples. But the examples are out there. They're examples that have existed for 200 years, the exact opposite of what they, the straw men that they create when they attack us. We have a million stories to show the beauty and success of markets, of capitalism throughout, uh, throughout these periods. I mean, you talked about a food crisis. Here's the solution to the food crisis. You could do it like that. Lower tariffs to zero in Europe on food. Allow importation of food from anywhere in the world into Europe. And you will see food manufacturing in Africa ramp up dramatically to export food to Europe. You won't do it because you're protective of your farmers, because it's protectionism. It's the exact opposite of markets. But we know how to solve every one of these problems. We know how to solve easily and quickly. It's a question of will and a question of a willingness to trust and, and, and be willing to accept the fact that some people are going to be offended by the fact that we're importing food from Africa. I love the word liberalism, but unfortunately, it was captured in the U.S. by the left. So, can you do something about it? <laughs> uh, that's the problem. If we give up on every one of the words, what's left for us? Supporting what uh, Aaron sa just said, uh, the current war of Russia against Ukraine is actually a development uh, which is a uh, result of Russia going back from the reforms, free market reforms. Uh, in, uh, in the 90s. So then they produced those reforms. They produced a tremendous success. In, uh, in 2011, after the, 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 the global whatever recession, and that's 2012, the Russian economy was almost equal to the German economy. In nominal terms, you know, in terms of GDP, the Russian economy was like two trillion uh, uh, 75 uh, uh, euro. So the German economy was uh, 3 trillion one, you know, that sort of stuff. Very, very close. And then they started going back. So before Crimea, they started uh, establishing the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, they uh, closed themselves from the, from the international market. If you look at the behavior of Russia compared, for example, to China, Russia was Russia and Brazil, they were misbehaving. India and China, they were developing the freedoms, you know. 
step by step in Russia, you know, with uh, some role backing in India and that sort of stuff. But if you look at it, uh, the economies, yeah. and of course, this is not the only reason for war, but this is one of the reasons that Putin started disliking, you know, political values and political regimes in Ukraine, in Moldova, in Georgia. That's why they started the wars. So because they did not like the success of capitalism in these countries. You look at, uh, uh, compare, compare, for example, uh, uh, Ukraine with Russia. All the indicators of Ukraine, they are not the best in the world. But if you take, you know, for example, 2010 and 2021, Ukraine improved three times. Russia stays on all the indicators there. Be this rule of law, be this freedom of expression, be this uh, uh, economic freedom, everything. Everything in Russia is the same. Georgia. Georgia made a tremendous success, you know, for the last 16, 17 years. You know, from like 102nd place in the world in terms of economic freedom, they are now fourth country in terms of economic freedom. And even the, 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 the classical liberals are not in charge of the country, nobody is changing the system because everybody sees, you know, it works. So when I, when I first spoke, um, I, I talked about frustration and I talked about the collusion of powerful interests that are preventing us from solving problems. And I think in terms of the, the story and the politics and, and capturing the public's imagination, we do need to find a way that we can connect with them emotionally. And, and Yaron and all of us were talking about the beauty of decentralization and, and what happens when people cooperate and the dignity that comes from being able to take care of your family and determine your own life. And we try to tell those stories, and those are beautiful stories. Um, and sometimes we're frustrated because we can't connect with a broader audience that don't see that there's only one path to that beauty, and that's letting be, people be free and asking governments to have enough humility to leave us alone. But right now, we're in the midst of a crisis. And as my wife, Terry, pointed out yesterday, I didn't know this, but apparently it was Winston Churchill that first said, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, the shit has hit the fan, people, and everything is messed up, and governments have failed us with lockdowns, with energy policy, with, with limits on economic activity. Um, they've created Putin's strength by limiting comp competition and our ability to create alternatives to energy. We should be pissed off. And in a crisis, when everything is bad, maybe after we've tried everything else, we might just try freedom. We might just demand that our political leaders and faceless bureaucrats in the EU and everybody that thinks they know better for us, we, we might just demand that they should back off and let us do this. So it's the, 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 the story, the message, the emotionally compelling way to connect with people is both there's beauty in being free and magical things happen when people cooperate, but there's also that rage against the machine. F those guys, leave us alone, we gotta fix this, you screwed it up. I think it's a beautiful conclusion to our debate. I wouldn't have summed it up better myself, definitely. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.